Hello and welcome to the sixth Oxford Archaeology Research Seminar, in which we will be discussing medieval urban provisioning 1066 to 1485. The seminar will focus on the provisioning of medieval towns across England with a particular emphasis on evidence from excavations undertaken by Oxford Archaeology and others in Carlisle, Oxford, Norwich, Kings Lynn and Colchester. Firstly, Denise Druce and Ian Smith from our Lancaster office will talk about the faunal and plant remains from the northern lanes in Carlisle. The excavated area formed the backlands of a series of medieval tenements established in the mid 12th century. Activity intensified in the later 13th century following the establishment of the lanes themselves. A range of industry related and trade activities took place and the finds provide a wealth of information about the provisioning of the everyday lives of the inhabitants. Rebecca Nicholson and Steve Teague will then present the results of several excavations undertaken by OA in Oxford. An important place throughout the medieval period, Oxford saw rising prosperity through the 12th and 13th centuries, at a time when the university emerged as a major factor in the town's economy. The talk will present evidence of the foodstuffs consumed as well as their likely origins and will explore what this can tell us about the status and lifestyle of the town's inhabitants. It will also consider whether, to, whether it is possible to identify changes in urban provisioning that may reflect changes in Oxford's hinterland. Graham Clark and Paul Sporry from our Cambridge office will then draw on evidence from excavations in and around Norwich, Kings Lynn and Colchester to look at the ways in which marginal land such as woodland, marsh and heath was exploited for different industrial uses, particularly in relation to the opportunities offered by nearby urban centres. The evidence can be hard to find and it is often necessary to look at both rural and urban locations to piece together the impact urban centres had on these rural industries. Our speakers will then be joined to discuss the sites and the questions they raise by the following distinguished panellists. Dr Ben Jervis of the University of Cardiff, who specialises in urbanism and material culture, will chair the discussion panel. Professor Chris Dyer of the University of Leicester, author of a number of key books on issues relating to provisioning. Dr Abby Antrobus, Senior Publications Office, Officer at Cotswold Archaeology, with expertise in urban development, medieval shops and retail. Dr Brian Ayres, former head of NAU and County Archaeologist for Norfolk, and with Abby, co-author of the medieval section of the recent research framework for East Anglia. And Dr John Schofield, a specialist in urban archaeology, particularly of London, and until recently the Cathedral Archaeologist of St Paul's Cathedral. They will be discussing the issues raised by the three talks in more detail, so please do send in your questions during the seminar via the Q&A function, and they will do their best to answer them. But first, I'll hand over to Denise Druce and to Ian Smith to talk about provisioning the backlands, recent work on animal bone and plant remains from Carlisle's medieval lanes. From 1978 to 1982, the former Carlisle Archaeological Unit carried out a programme of archaeological investigation at the Lanes in the northeast corner of Carlisle's historic centre prior to redevelopment. The site was traversed by 19 narrow lanes from which the area took its name, extending east from Scotch Street, one of Carlisle's principal historic thoroughfares, to Lowther Street, which follows the line of the east wall of the medieval city, demolished in the early 19th century. Overall, the development occupied 2.8 hectares, or approximately 10% of the walled area, of which approximately 0.6 hectares were subject to some form of archaeological excavation. However, work was focused primarily on the northern part of the site, where a controlled open area excavation of about 0.13 hectares was conducted. This core area encompassed parts of five medieval tenements, plots A to E, each five to six metres wide, and approaching 100 metres long, extending east from Scotch Street to the city wall, the site lying behind the street frontage in the backlands of these plots. The tenements were established in the mid to late 12th century, with the lanes themselves, of which four were investigated, being placed between the plot boundaries during the second half of the 13th century, probably to facilitate access to the rear of the burgages as multiple occupancy became increasingly common and complex. This layout of tenements and lanes remained essentially unchanged until the late 20th century, when it was swept away by the new development. I will now pass you over to my colleagues Ian Smith and Denise Druce 
to tell you more about the paleoecology of the site. This section of the seminar is about plants and animal remains from an area of Carlisle called the Lane. Dr Denise Druce will talk about the plant remains and I'm going to talk about the animal bones. The excavations at the Lanes were some of the biggest in northern England and although dug in the 1970s and 80s, they were only recently analysed and published. All of this biological material came from burgage or backland plots, meaning narrow strips of land behind the street frontage. One of the questions we've been trying to answer is where did all the bones come from? How much of the stock was raised on the plots and how much was brought in from outside? In the case of any wild fauna, it seems to be clear that the bones must have come from outside. And that must surely apply also to any large groups of cattle horn cores. Meanwhile, it's quite possible that chickens and pigeons and pigs were raised on the plots. And we, we should consider the possibility that some stock may have been brought within the city walls and possibly to these plots at night. However, the area was more open or less built up in the earliest phases and so whilst in the 13th century cattle and sheep might have grazed nearby and could have been brought to the plots, it's possible that this became increasingly difficult in later phases. At this stage we should remind ourselves of an important principle which is that we only recover a tiny proportion of the fauna that once lived. So here the life assemblage could be a herd of cattle or the flocks of sheep across a landscape and hundreds of animals might be represented whereas the identifiable and analysed assemblage of bones might consist of just a few specimens. That's because most of the bones will not survive. They'll have been destroyed by weathering on the surface or they'll have been chewed up by dogs or foxes or pigs. They'll have been lost, in other words, to the archaeological record through taphonomic processes. There's nothing we can do about these early stages of loss. But at the recovery stage, our actions on site do make a difference. If we take soil samples and if we sieve, we avoid some of the biases known to result from a, a reliance on hand collection. And it's important to recognise that this assemblage is a product of its time. The sieved fraction is very small, and so we must expect that small bones will be underrepresented. This includes, for instance, the bones of chickens or smaller birds and the small bones of mammals. And for instance, sheep toe bones or phalanges will plausibly be underrepresented as, com as compared to the major limb bones such as the femur or humerus. There may well also be a bias in favour of cattle bones as compared to those of sheep and pigs. Some of the pigs are very large compared to national data, including from prehistoric sites. This includes a third metacarpal from LALC Context 16.3, which has a greatest length following von Dendriesch of 87.4 millimetres. This is the one on the far right. This bone is plausibly from a hunted wild boar, since wild boar survived into the 13th century in Britain, and it was found in association with butchered roe deer bones. The much smaller pig third metacarpal, second from the right, is from the late medieval period 17a and is just most plausibly to be from a domesticate. The shot on the left shows that such size variations exist in other pig elements such as the radius and ulna. Most of the pigs are certainly from domesticated animals and not from wild boar. This is according to various measurements of bone ends and according to the tooth sizes. They include pigs that suffered serious injuries, which they survived or recovered from prior to their final demise or slaughter. Some of these injuries or pathologies affect the skulls or crania, including the frontal bones. And one illustrated here is perforated and clearly healed, whilst others bear a spongy impacted area. Pigs do get injuries in rutting fights, but the distribution of these particular injuries suggests that they're the result of human control. There are historical references to pigs escaping and running free 
and we know that people are indicted for the damage caused. Some of the pig bones from the lanes are very small, and this suggests that some pigs farrowed on the backland plots, but that does not exclude the possibility that pork and bacon were also bought from city butchers. Injuries or pathologies affecting pig bones are not restricted to the skull. As an example, there's a fractured humerus distal end with evidence for major remodeling of the shaft, which again suggests that the pig survived the injury. Below that specimen, there's a, a normal humerus with the associated radius and ulna. Moving on to a completely different point, it's worth mentioning that pigs can have a major effect on bone survival. And so, if pigs were loose on a plot, many of the bones dumped after butchery or from table waste would disappear. Pigs also turn over the earth, and that raises some interesting archaeological questions. Pigs must surely have been excluded from any area with vegetable plots or with bedding trenches. And wherever pigs did have access, unless they were on a hard standing, we should perhaps suggest uh, homo homogenous layers of, of worked turned earth. In trying to reconstruct a picture of provisioning on these plots, dogs should also be mentioned, as they were certainly present and they're a major source of bone loss through their gnawing and swallowing of bones. And that probably means that the bones of younger and smaller animals will be underrepresented. Groups of cattle horn cores and cranial bones on these plots could relate to horn working, but in addition they could be waste resulting from the preparation of oxhead dishes. There's no stratigraphic evidence of a tannery in the form of tanning pits, for instance, and so no evidence for the working of cattle hides. Most of the butchered postcranial or main meat bearing cattle bones, such as the humerus at bottom left, were probably dumped into the backland plots after being bought from the city butchers. Moving on to the goats, phase 13 produced the largest number of goat identifications and the presence of goat horn cores and other goat bones suggests perhaps the import of goat carcasses and skins and possibly the toying or working of these skins in this area. The red and roe deer remains include some from major meat bearing parts such as the pelvis. You can see one of those on the right and also antler from hunted and butchered roe deer. The antler on the left is not shed antler, it bears a deep cut below the burr. In the earlier periods, uh, 13 to 15, red and roe deer are recovered, and in periods 16 and 17 we see increasing numbers of fallow deer, and this is a trend seen across the country. It's possible that red and roe deer were hunted in the large forest that was known as Inglewood, and was to the south of Carlisle. Now to the bird bones and the chicken and galliform bones, which include some from clearly immature birds. And this suggests that chickens were possibly raised on the plots, at least in periods 13 and 14. The fact that some woodcock is present suggests at least some birds from wild fowling, whether procured direct or bought in the city. Some geese and ducks then, by extrapolation, might be wild although it's probable that domesticated geese were also raised in the city and probably on these plots. The sternum specimen on the left is quite small and is thought most probably to be from the genus Branta and so maybe from a wild goose. However, there is certainly not enough of the specimen to confidently distinguish species or wild from domesticate based on morphological criteria alone. What we can say about this sternum is that it bears some obvious fine cut marks and is plausibly being carved at the table. Returning to the cattle for a second, it's worth mentioning that both dairying and ploughing were probably of more importance than beef production. We can also say that the domesticated mammals comprise the bulk of the bones and thus probably the bulk of the meat consumed on the plots. But we have to qualify that by returning to the issue of recovery and it's probable that both domesticated and wild birds are underrepresented. And with that, I'll now hand over to Denise Druce. The following presents some of the results of the archaeobotanical study from the medieval lanes. Although my involvement with the project was primarily concerned with the charred plant remains and charcoal, I will be presenting the results of the remains, primarily fruits and seeds, which survived under waterlogged 
or anoxic conditions. These were analysed by my colleague, Murray Rutherford. The contents of this presentation, however, and any of its shortcomings, are purely mine. Although the child remains provided important data for the cereal-based economy of the site, the waterlogged remains from Carlisle have provided a wealth of information on the types of native plants and trees growing both locally and perhaps near to or on the plots themselves, and also those from further afield. You will notice that I have seized on the opportunity to present the evidence with a rich array of images, not least those from the Tacunium sanitatus, a 14th, 15th century illuminated manuscript which illustrates and describes the various dietary and health benefits of many of the plants recorded at the site. Although many deposits from a range of different feature types and occupation phases were analysed, many of the richest plant assemblages came from relatively deep pits, probably dug for waste disposal, related to at the earliest phases of post roman activity, which you can see here included mid, late 12th, early 13th century pits, and period 14, mid 13th century features. As might be expected from urban sites, these pits were repositories for a range of different household waste, including fuel debris, fuel waste, kitchen waste, and judging by the, ev the evidence for intestinal parasites, fecal material. Several wells were also present, including the one shown here in blue, but these, along with many of the shallower features, contained relatively fewer remains. Some of the most numerous remains found on the site comprise seeds and fruits from common wild gathered or homegrown fruits and nut trees, some of which are shown here on this beautiful image. These included hazelnut shell, sloes, damson stroke billis. It's very difficult to tell the difference between these two, blackberries and elderberries. Apple stroke pear pips were also recovered on the site, and although it is difficult to tell the difference between these and our native crab apple based on the seeds alone, eating apples, in the modern sense of the word, were grown widely as a commercial crop by the 13th century. It is possible, of course, that small orchards or even single trees were present on the plots. Rare fragments of walnut shell were also recovered from the site. And although I have found it difficult to pin down the exact status of English walnut in medieval Britain, finds of both its fruit and pollen have been recorded throughout the period. Historical accounts of walnut being grown in garden plots are rare, however, although this is perhaps not surprising given the size of the mature walnut tree. Other remains from Carlisle included probably imported food items, which are commonly recovered from medieval sites. These included figs, beautifully illustrated here, and grapes. Although these may have been grown in garden plots, it is likely to have been with limited success given the British climate, and this would have been especially so in Northern Britain. It is not surprising then that the most common medieval grape product was verjuice, a citrus tasting liquid produced from unripe grapes and apparently used as an alternative to lemon juice. Given the lack of evidence for vineyards at Carlisle, however, it is likely that even products such as verjuice would have been imported into the city. Imported dried fruits from the continent, such as raisins and figs, would have been an important food commodity, especially when wild food and seasonally grown vegetables were in short supply. Imported items such as figs are often considered a luxury item. Their presence at many medieval sites, however, suggests they may have been consumed by most classes. Positive evidence for the utilisation of resources closer to home is provided by the remains of moorland plants such as heather and sphagnum moss and a range of wetland plants such as marsh marigold, marsh zinc foil and cotton grass which together with the remains of rhizomes and tubers and cone bases of grasses arrived on the site as part of peat turves used for construction or fuel. This evidence is underpinned by a charter of 1352, in which Edward III granted the citizens of Carlisle the right to dig turves on the King's Moor, an area now known as King Moor, situated just north of the city. Seeds and fruits from a wide range of herbs were also recovered, dominated by common rude rules of waste places and disturbed or cultivated ground. These included common nettle, buttercup, sorrel, 
pale persicaria and chickweed. These types of plants would have flourished on the backlands of the plots. It is possible they were used to supplement dishes, especially during periods when other green vegetables were in short supply. One of the most prominent herbs at Carlisle included fat hen, also known as goosefoot or goose grass, and the list goes on which represents a wild native variety of quinoa, a protein and fibre rich food source, commonly used today in salads and broths. Given the plant contains the toxin saponin, however, which is proven to aggravate pre-existing gastric issues, any parts of this plant would have been best cooked or soaked prior to use. Also of note were numerous seeds of nipplewort shown here, which plants for the future suggests can be added to soups and salads and as a good alternative to spinach. Seeds of wild mignonette or weld were also recovered. The latter, also known as Dyer's Rocket, renowned for dyeing cloth and wool a lovely deep yellow. Corn marigold seeds were also very abundant at the site and although not particularly noted for its culinary use, corn marigold was a ubiquitous weed of arable crops and cultivation. The image shown here on the left, very reminiscent of my allotment when I haven't been down there for a while. Its presence at Carlisle could signify small plots of cultivation. Alternatively, however, the seeds may have arrived at the site alongside cereal crops or straw. Hemlock seeds were also recovered, often in quite large quantities. All parts of this plant are highly poisonous, However, with the right knowledge, it was commonly used as a salve to treat gout and inflammation and for eye complaints. It was also one of Ag Agatha Christie's favoured poisons. With a lack of accompanying evidence for a physician's garden, I personally find its presence at Carlisle and other medieval urban sites I have worked on rather curious. A large plant frequently found growing on damp ground, roadsides and hedgerows. Hemlock would have been a notable plant and perhaps even feared. It is possible, however, that it would have thrived in urban areas during periods of neglect or abandonment. I hope this has given you a flavour, no pun intended, of the type of plant remains often recovered from medieval sites, which can provide a wealth of information about the types of plant resources, be it gathered, cultivated or imported in early urban centres such as Carlisle. I would now like to hand over to Rebecca Nicholson, who will be talking about medieval provisioning in Oxford, which I'm sure will include a few items I have already discussed. Thank you. There have been over 100 excavations carried out in and around Oxford, many of them by Oxford Archaeology. And it's this accumulation of evidence that's allowed us to piece together how people lived shedding light on long distance trade routes as well as more local sources of produce. For this talk I'm going to focus on one of our excavations that is of the, on the site of the Oxford Westgate Centre which you can see um, towards the bottom left of the map. Oxford was probably a market town from its foundation. It's surrounded at the east, south and west by the rivers Thames and Charwell and the town had direct access to London via the Thames, so trade between Oxford and London was well established by the 11th century. In the 13th and 14th centuries, Oxford was the only major town in the Thames Valley above London, and its inhabitants possessed extensive trading privileges there. However, the town also lay on important roads, including the main north-south road from Northampton to Salisbury, Winchester and Southampton, and to the west, the routeway from London through Gloucester and to the Welsh borders. And this position has also been key to its development and provisioning. Oxford's rising prosperity in the later 12th and early 13th centuries was based largely on its trade in cloth and wool, facilitated by its location close to the Cotswold wool producing area. But also, Oxford would also have been an important centre for the grain trade. The area around Oxford was and still is a major cereal producing region. So to turn to our excavations at the Westgate, by the mid 13th century, both the Grey Friars, the Franciscans, and the Black Friars, the Dominicans, had acquired parcels of land on the outskirts of town, and we conducted major excavations on the site of the Grey Friars in 2014 16. Uh, it's located under what is now the Westgate Shopping Centre. Of course, the mendicant orders 
were heavily involved in study and teaching and so they bridged town and gown. The animal bones from these pre friary deposits were studied by my colleague Ian Smith. They reflect the focus on wool production being dominated by the bones of sheep, followed by cattle, pig, chicken and goose, with occasional bones of wild species, red fallow and roe deer, duck, woodcock, snipe, a small galley form, as well as swan and a few songbirds. The high proportion of sheep is a probable reflection of the regional agricultural scene, with sheep brought in on the hoof from the Cotswolds and slaughtered after providing a few clips of their prime wool, while the wild birds were probably have been caught on the floodplain pastures and marsh which surround Oxford. The domestic birds probably were kept in backyards. It's likely that cattle were grazed on the floodplain meadows around Oxford and slaughtered in the town. This is indicated by the presence of most of an articulated and fairly elderly cow which we found in a gravel deposit in the Trill Mill stream. It's been radiocarbon dated to 1044 to 1267. It's likely the carcass had been washed downstream from the direction of the castle in a flood but while we originally thought it was a complete animal, Ian's work has shown us that some butchery had already taken place and the horns had been chopped off the skull. So it's likely that animals were butchered at or close to the site and pigs at least seem to have been kept and bred there as evidenced by a prenatal piglet bone. This finding is consistent with isotopic evidence recently published by Craig Atkins et al that pigs were increasingly fed an omnivorous diet in the centuries after the Norman conquest in Oxford whereas previously uh, the evidence suggests that they were panaged in local woodland. The presence of red deer foot bones and also badger bone with skinning marks may indicate small scale processing of skins, but other deer bones clearly show evidence of the butchery of main venison bearing parts, and it's probable that the deer were procured locally. However, um, at nearby Ensham Abbey, fallow deer was also recorded from 12th to 13th century deposits, and there isotopic evidence indicates that those deer, deer were raised on chalklands, so were not local. The plant remains from the Westgate Centre have been studied by my colleague Julia Mean. In these pre friary deposits, they include free threshing and a little rivet wheat, hulled barley, rye and oats, as well as pulses, that is peas and beans, and fruits which include blackberry or raspberry, cherry or damson, sloe, apple, strawberry and fig, as well as walnut. Many of the fruits were probably gathered locally, but apples, cherries, plums and walnuts may have been grown in orchards. And fig, at least, is evidence of an imported dried fruit. The abundant pulses are notable because while they might have been regularly eaten, Peas and beans are rarely charred and so they often don't survive archaeologically. The legumes might be a reflection of a three field system operating in the Oxford hinterland. That is a staggered sequence of grain followed by legumes and fallow on rotation. It's likely that the cereals came from an area perhaps within a 12 mile radius of Oxford and they might have been grown as mixed crops. Three threshing wheat barley, rye and possibly cultivated oats were all recovered from a 13th century rural site at Graven Hill near Bicester, which is north of Oxford. We also have evidence of a mixed crop or drage at Merton College. Our earlier excavations included the excavation of a late 12th century pit where we had a rich deposit of sprouted grain which comprised both barley and oats, suggesting that a mixed crop or drage was malted for the production of beer. We also had um, evidence in that pit fill for a lot of fruit stones and, and seeds um, and the processing of fruit. Whether these two are related is unclear. Later deposits at the same site included possible evidence of ornamental planting, orchards and a possible physic garden, as well as um, imported fruit, grape and figs, which again had probably been dried. Moving back now to the Westgate Centre, but also typical of sites of um, similar date across Oxford, we'll look a little bit at fish. The fish assemblage included a range of both sea fish and freshwater fish, but it was dominated by the bones of herring and eel, which is commonly the case for sites of this date in Oxford, but also elsewhere. The eels would have been abundant in river streams and especially mill ponds, and they were probably trapped locally using baskets made of willow wood which were often strung together 
and, and suspended from fishing weirs, as in the illustration. Eels may also have been imported from much further away, as salted fish. Herring would certainly have been transported from the coast, packed in barrels and preserved by the addition of salt. Records from the Doomsday Book suggest that catches of herring, which was mostly from eastern England, particularly the ports of East Anglia, um, exceeded 3 million fish, and this expanded in later centuries. Other sea fish include cod, ling, haddock, whiting, rays, plaice, gurnards, conger eel, and horse mackerel. And it's likely that all of these uh, were imported as preserved fish, because fish is a very perishable product, and Oxford is about as far from the coast as you can get in England. While salt herring can last perhaps a few months, Less oily fish, such as cod and ling, can be dried and is almost indestructible in that form. It'll last more than a year. It therefore provided a useful storable food, particularly invaluable for the increasing number of days when eating meat from four-legged animals was prohibited by the church. Cod and related species have been traded as stored fish from Norway in the north of Scotland since at least Viking times, but the trade in this product really took off from the 11th century. Typically, these fish, which were known as stockfish, were cut it, gutted and beheaded before drying. And you can see um, in the picture on the bottom right-hand side, some of these fish suspended from a, a rack and drying. In the Westgate assemblage, the bones from the large cod also include a few head bones, as well as the bones um, from the areas of the body usually present in the stockfish, which are the vertebrae and bones of the shoulder. This could mean that some fish were brought into Oxford as fresh fish, but it could also mean that dried cod's heads were sold as a separate product. Also clearly important to the townsfolk of, o townsfolk of Oxford were the freshwater fisheries. Freshwater fish um, include, the, at the Westgate, include a similar sort of um, range to what we found from other sites across the town. They include young pike, um, which were known as pickerel, roach and other small cyprinids, small perch and occasionally trout, many of which were under 20 centimetres, often under 15 centimetres long, so small fish. And, and usually, or less usually, um, at the Westgate Centre, we also have juvenile burbot. Burbot is the only freshwater codfish, and it was extinct in the UK by the middle of the last century, but used to be common in the rivers and fens of eastern England. Anecdotally, it might have once inhabited the Thames, um, and our evidence, I think, supports that view and is interesting in that regard. It's interesting that Burbot was only identified in the 11th and 12th century deposits at the Westgate and elsewhere it, it's also of that date or earlier. Burbot are sensitive to pollution and the presence here of young fish um, may reflect the, uh, the presence here of young fish and not in later deposits um, may reflect the later pollution of the rivers with urban waste. Other finds include a small number of oysters which indicates some availability and consumption of what is a very perishable foodstuff. In this case, the shellfish must have been packed alive in barrels or in water-filled holes in boats because the shells wouldn't have been transported inland if the shellfish were pickled. If we move on now to the excavation of the friary itself, as you can see, we excavated much of the friary precinct. Now, the Franciscan friars were traditionally reliant on donations or arms, so the friars' diet could be assumed to have been relatively meagre and reflective of the diet of poorer townsfolk, which would have been mainly based around cereals and pulses, perhaps supplemented with a few foodstuffs grown in the friary gardens, but with a general focus on cheaper and vegetable-based meals. In common with members of other religious orders, um, which include scholars, Friars were expected to adhere to strict rules governing their daily lives, which restricted the consumption of meat. Typically, in the early years, it was only supposed to be eaten as a remedy for sickness or great feebleness. And in the case of the friars, fasting was observed for long periods of time. But finding evidence for a vegetable diet a vegetable-based diet is challenging because the remains are not likely to be preserved archaeologically, perhaps occasionally in waterlogged features or as lipid residues in ceramics, but otherwise not. However, from the early years, the friar friaries were used to house and feed lay benefactors, some of whom would be wealthy and not constrained by the austere dietary requirements of the order. And that needs to be borne in mind when we look at what sorts of evidence we recovered. During the excavation, we were lucky enough to encounter intact surfaces relating to the fiery kitchen, as well as rubbish pits that were associated with the same kitchens. The charred deposits within and surrounding the ovens included abundant charcoal, 
from faggots and other wood used to fire the ovens. And the faggots, which were hazel, alder and willow brown wood, um, are likely to have been collected in the nearby woodlands. But the larger charcoal might have come from further afield. In general, from sites in Oxford, we found a move from oak-dominated charcoal to beech at around the 14th century, which seems likely to signify a change in the provisioning of wood and charcoal from the local woodlands to the importation of beech wood or charcoal from the Chilterns, where ancient woodland is predominantly beech. If we look now at the other plant remains, the most significant of them are the exotic food plants, which may be indicative of imported or luxury foods. In addition to grape, fig and walnut, they include almond and pine nut, Pine nut comes from the stone pine tree. Stone pine and almond are native to the Mediterranean and it's likely that these items reflect a burgeoning trade from that region, perhaps sourced through London merchants or possibly by the friars themselves since as a mendicant order some of the brethren might have travelled in warmer countries. Coriander was probably cultivated in a herb garden and walnut trees might have been grown near to the friary as well. A similar suite of plant remains was also found in samples from our earlier excavations at Blackfriars. Turning now to the animal bone, despite the increasing number of meat-free days that were imposed by the church throughout the medieval period and the doctrine of abstinence, during the early and later years of the friary, meat was most certainly eaten. Sheep bones were again the most numerous again probably a reflection of the importance of the wool trade but beef and pork were consumed as well there are also bones from chicken and geese hares and rabbits rabbit warrens were present in britain from the late 12th century but rabbit was expensive records from merton college mention that in 1395 rabbits were bought for a feast but cost six to eight pence a pair and were transported at the cost of half a pence each from Bushy in Hertfordshire to Oxford. Bones of red and fallow deer clearly represent the consumption of some venison. While prominent members of the clergy were allowed to hunt deer in the 14th century, it's, it's probably more likely that these um, were donations from a wealthy benefactor. The most notable feature of the animal bone assemblage, though, is the high proportion of bird remains, which outnumber the mammalian domestic stock um, in terms of fragment count from the mid 14th century onwards and is probably linked to religious observance. So more birds um, were eaten as well as fish and fewer four-legged animals because it, both fish and bird could be eaten when um, red meat was not allowed. Of the bird bones, 58% of, of chicken, 15% of geese and 7% of pigeons. The pigeons were probably kept in a dovecote at the friary and the chickens and geese could also have been kept in the friary grounds. Eggshells also abundant, an indication of the popularity of eggs in the friary diet. Wild birds include woodcock, teal, partridge, snipe and small songbirds, which together with the deer and the hare provide evidence of hunting and fowling. Consumption of wildfowl is generally connected to high status households in medieval England but waders are found throughout urban assemblages and it's likely these birds could be obtained from the urban market. Moving forwards in time it's generally accepted that as the Middle Ages progressed religious individuals and that included friars became more lax in following their respective rules and the rules themselves became a little bit um, more a little bit uh, less austere and we can perhaps see that from the Westgate material. By the end of the 15th century, there seems to be a large increase in the proportion of cattle bones and there are lots of calves, which probably reflect the rise of the dairy industry, but also clearly reflect um, the increased supply of veal. A significant proportion of pigs were killed as picklets, and you can't help thinking you know, of the friars eating suckling pig. The bird bones include heron and swan, and butchery marks indicate that swan was prepared for the table. Historical records suggest from the 12th century, the legal capture and consumption of mute swan was restricted to royalty in some noble households and elite colleges. So it's possible that the swan was supplied to the friary through one of these sources, perhaps as a uh, dish for a feast. Like rabbit, bones of swans, herons and other status birds um, have found been found in association with um, college dining at a number of our sites. So all that suggests, you know, fairly affluent dining at the friary, but not necessarily by the, the brethren themselves. As I said before, this might, you know, this might be for special meals, this might be for and lay benefactors. But we can see the same the same pattern from the fish remains. In addition to the bones of sea fish found in the pre-friary deposits, 
where other fish such as grey mullet, mackerel, sea bream and hake. I mention hake because that's quite significant because it's a fish that is predominantly found in the seas around Ireland and southwest Britain. So it may be evidence of fish being brought from that region at that time. There was also a demopteric from a large Atlantic sturgeon in one of the mid 14th to mid 15th century pits. Since most sturgeon bones from English sites were identified as European sturgeon, this is quite significant. Sturgeon used to occur in all the major European rivers, but it's now extinct across most of Western Europe and archaeologically their remains are normally restricted to urban, monastic and aristocratic contexts. In 1324, sturgeon was declared a royal fish and consequently it features on the menu of uh, royal and aristocratic feasts that portions were also sold on the open market and it was typically traded as a salt fish. Notably, European sturgeon was identified in many samples and also was hand collected finds from our excavations in at Blackfriars. Freshwater fish, mainly small fish, were also common. Throughout the medieval and later centuries, freemen, some of whom were fishermen and fishmongers based in Oxford, were allowed to catch fish in the free waters of Oxford, which stretched from Magdalen Bridge to Godstow. And it's likely these fish were sold in the town's market or supplied direct to more affluent households. By at least the 14th century, there were stalls in St Aldate's, which at that point in time was called Fish Street, selling both stored fish, which included dried stockfish and salted herrings, as well as fresh fish. In 1360, the fishmongers' stalls in St Aldate's comprised 18 stalls for Winchelsea fish and others for stockfish and herrings, and so-called foreign fishmongers had stalls on the north side of High Street. Shellfish were also sold. The shellfish from the Westgate include both oysters and mussels. Oyster shells can be useful um, in determining provisioning routes because in some cases they include evidence of damage inflicted by the mudworms, as an organism called Polydora hoplora. It makes U-shaped tunnels on the insides of shells. The, the distribution of this organism is largely, as far as the Richards goes, to the, to the south and southwest. So where you find it, you can suggest that that's the area that the shells that the oysters came from but at, from the Westgate Centre there was very little evidence of it which could indicate that these shellfish came from the Thames estuary perhaps or the Blackwater estuary or Colchester Whitstable somewhere in that sort of area and just to mention a couple of other finds the ceramics have been studied by uh, John Cotter, one of our colleagues. Brill stalware was the commonest medieval glazed ware found at the Westgate and across much of medieval Oxford. It comes from kilns from the villages of Brill and Borstal in Buckinghamshire. At the Westgate, um, handle skillets, divided dishes and unusual green glazed baluster jugs, which you can see here, are common. Um, the jugs have been assigned the name Westgate style jugs because they're almost unique to this site. They date from 1350 to 1425 and might have been commissioned directly from the Brill Potters by the Greyfriars themselves. Lipid analysis of one shard of a Brill Borstal bottle revealed evidence of a brassica seed oil, probably radish oil, and it's concluded it had been used as a container for refilling oil lamps um, for illuminating parts of the Friary Church. So to summarise, it looks like what we have um, in the 15th century at Greyfriars is, as I've said before, fairly affluent dining, similar to that which we find in the college assemblages. So I'm going to finish up by just showing very quickly some evidence we had from our excavations of a new college kitchen, where you can see again, we were lucky enough to excavate the kitchen deposits and lovely charred kitchen floor surfaces, although in this case, no charred plant remains beyond charcoal. We did though get huge amounts of bone um, from two large refuse pits and smaller bones from those ashy kitchen floor deposits. It's clear a wide range of meats were eaten, which included beef and much of the catch cattle butchery had obviously taken place before the joints arrived at the college. Significantly, large numbers of lumbar vertebrae and pelvic bones um, were present, representing a restricted range of highly prized and expensive cuts of beef. Whole calf carcasses were present, which indicated that the fellows had a taste for veal, as at the Westgate. The medieval fellows also ate large quantities of mutton, but these represent the modern cut of loin best end and mutton forequarters, which approximate to the modern half-shoulder joint, um, which is used 
fully roasted. Pork was also eaten and almost half the pig bones were from piglets. Again, makes you think of suckling pig on the menu. In addition to these domesticated species, the fellows also feasted on choice cuts of venison, rabbit, hare and birds, which included cranes, which is a very prestigious bird, and snipes as well as chickens, pigeons, geese, and wild ducks. The sea fish is quite similar to what we found at the Westgate, but there isn't any sturgeon, or at least we didn't find any, but there were salmon and large pike, which again, would have been expensive. And hake was also present. I think that supports the evidence that what we find at the Greyfriars uh, is very similar to what we're finding from the, from the medieval colleges in the 15th century to going moving towards the dissolution at least and so on that note I think I will now hand over to our next speaker which is Graham Clark uh, with Paul Sperry from OE East who'll talk about iron charcoal pottery and salt urban provisioning from marginal rural landscapes in eastern England. Hello everyone Welcome to a short talk on two recent excavations by Oxford Archaeology, which provide some insights into the provisioning of medieval Colchester with charcoal and medieval Bishop's Lynn, today King's Lynn, with salt. These products will highlight the advantage of having marginal environments, such as woodland and salt marsh, near to hand, and their role in supplying the wider range of resources necessary for the success of a medieval town. However, resources and commodities like charcoal and salts are invisible in the archaeological record of towns where they are entirely consumed or passed through the marketplace as invisible trade to leave no trace, which presents a problem to the archaeologist who is used to working with materials. An excavation north of Colchester has served as a useful example of how to draw together the separate strands of charcoal production in woodland and its consumption within the town. Located five kilometres north of the town centre, the historical woodland of Kesterwold, a group of 24 charcoal-making pit kilns were revealed, which are radiocarbon dated to between the 12th and 13th centuries. The pit kilns contained charcoal-rich but otherwise sterile fills, but studies of similar groups of pit kilns in the Low Countries, where they are known as Grubenmeiler, suggests a strong link between this early mode of charcoal making to iron bloomery furnaces. It was realised that there was a shift to blast furnaces around the end of the 13th century, which coincided with the disappearance of pit kilns in the archaeological records, and the appearance of much larger mound kilns or clamps able to produce the far greater volumes of charcoal required. Just provided a, a slide here just to provide a better example of um, what pit kilns might have looked like. They are biochar kilns, but uh, they leave the same imprint as the charcoal pits did in the medieval period. Because I think there's a common um, assumption that uh, during the whole of the medieval period, um, clan kilns were in use to produce um, charcoal. I think this earlier mode of production is, that you see here is um, a lot more true to the archaeology we get in the ground. And um, it's used as fertiliser today, but it's chemically and physically no different to charcoal. So here's a map of where our site was now in Colchester. So in the historical Kester Wall, which uh, stretched from Colchester and the Colm all the way up to the River Stour. But um, as the city limits have been pushing outwards, archaeological investigations have periodically unearthed similar groups of charcoal pit kilns in the former woodland, none of which have been radiocarbon dated later than the early medieval period. They all fall between that 10th and 13th century brackets within our period of study, the medieval period. So this reflects this, the postulated link uh, I mentioned earlier of um, this type of early charcoal production to bloomery furnaces and to iron production more generally. But um, so how does this um, relate to Colchester? Well, here's a slide of Colchester. Um, this is Colchester around 1500 and uh, essentially gone through the HER and gone through a few site 
reports. And um, it's really it was really difficult to find any examples of iron working within Colchester. They might not have been found yet, but uh, but there we go. There's been a quite widespread um, spread of archaeological work within the city. So when we um, look at the distribution of excavated early medieval industrial sites, it's quite a limited search within our period of study. Something that's broadly contemporary with our kilns. There's only the sites at Slyne Walk that so far produced any substantial enough assemblage of later 11th century tap slag to indicate the presence of a bloomery furnace within the town. But, importantly, the high temperatures for charcoal that charcoal produced was also required in the production of uh, other materials, namely quicklime. And glass making, which have a far greater archaeological signature in the town. So during the early medieval period, quicklime was produced by roasting chalk or crushed oyster shell, which I discovered, with charcoal in four to five metre diameter pits with daub superstructures. And as you can see, a search of the heritage environment record has shown up multiple lime kiln sites across the town. So that is a, an important outlet for um, the charcoal that might have been produced in Kesterwald was perhaps making its way into town. Perhaps not for iron production, primarily perhaps in our case, there was a lot of charcoal going into these uh, lime kilns in the making of quicklime. Because quicklime and sand is a building water and uh, the fact that a lot of them lie close to the castle, the abbey, and the churches um, possibly accounts for um, for um, uh, why they are where they are. Essentially, they're there uh, in the construction of these early medieval these buildings. So the ones at Lyons Walk were actually radiocarbon dated. So we've got one site that was radiocarbon dated between 1150 to 1250 which is bang on what we want, really, because that is broadly contemporary with the, uh, the charcoal pit kilns of Great Horksley. So nothing definitive, but, you know, we've got something to go on. And uh, there's also glass as well. Not as a footnote, it's an important um, outlet as well that required um, charcoal. So there has been a site identified towards the western end of the town. But there's a lot firmer archaeological and historical evidence to the east of the town, outside the city walls, but it's still there. So, and it's a, it's a plot of land called Glass Rice Land, which is rather nice. But, um, and they reckon that that, with historical records, there's a link to the very end of the 13th century. So, there we go. So, to sum up, yes. There's charcoal making in the Kester world, which we have a nice marginal environment, um, quite an extensive marginal environment uh, stretching to the north of Colchester. But um, there is Colchester, which is thirsty in the early medieval period for building material, um, namely quicklime as part of that for the construction of stone churches, the abbey, the castle. So there could be a link. So it's reasonable to um, to put them together and um, start talking about um, the cause and effect of um, Colchester's effect on Kesterwald and vice versa. But um, cracking on, we're moving up to Kings Lynn, the other side of um, East Anglia now. So it's the key provision of salt for a coastal site. So it's we excavated on a quite an important historical salt marsh north of the medieval town of Bishop's Lynn, which is present day King's Lynn. And uh, we excavated a total of 11 11th and 12th century salt making sites or salterns. And there's a nice, I've just pulled up a graphic, a nice map for you there of the salt marsh in relation to, to King's Lynn. And you can see they're very proximal. So it was a valuable commodity. And it was essential for the preservation of foodstuffs. 
principally fish and meat within the town. So there was a trade and stock fish, fish, meat. So all these places have been mapped um, as part of the Kingsland survey. There was excavations undertaken in the 1960s, for example, which confirms cod as an important part of the, the diet of the inhabitants. So I should say, sorry, that yeah, this is a map of uh, King's Lynn, medieval Bishop's Lynn, and um, it's just kind of, I just highlighted on the map, you know, the, the butchers, where stock fish rule was, the fishmongers, just just to give you an impression of um, the, the town way back then. It's uh, the archaeological signature for salt. How do we, how do we get that? We can't really, that's the limits of archaeology. We don't, unfortunately, there's no, you have the animal bones, you have fish bones, you have the plant remains, you have lots of pottery, lots of materials, but you're not going to get a barrel of salt. So it'd be wonderful, but um, we, we don't have that yet. So there's no archaeological signature for salt, but there there is thankfully historical records which can, which do demonstrate actually a strong link between the town and the salt marsh, which is once owned by the bishops of Norwich, and uh, salt was a valuable stream of revenue for the bishops, which even helped finance the building of the town's Benedictine Priory and St Margaret's Church. And the town burgesses were also interested in the affairs of the marsh as well. So I just pulled up a graphic for you there. There's just so some of the some of the, I'm not going to pull up the actual charters for you. But these are some of the records that I was looking through to get a, get a good handle of um, the link between the two um, environments of the town and the salt marsh. Oh, and again, yeah, the, the, again, looking at historical records, the, 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 even they are slight, especially when you get down to the individual level. But, you know, it's quite fun. We got a salt trader in, in the 12th century, a Reginaldus Salsarius, a salt trader. And we do actually have a, a personal name as well of Salter in the record as well. I think that was uh, in the 13th century. There's an interesting footnote to the salt industry. Um, we'll just um, get through to the ends now. In that um, the scale of the salt industry itself on the salt marsh had an important legacy for the provisions of meat and wool from the 13th century onwards. And I think it's, a, it's an underappreciated influence of coastal change, moving these vast quantities of mods which ultimately produced piecemeal reclamation of the viable tracts of grazing land for sheep on the coastal coastal salt marsh. So it's quite a good economic shift there, which is actually mapped out in the archaeology in the grounds and in the historical record as well, because you get, um, with the rise of the textile revolution from the 14th century, um, salt workers are actually recorded turning more and more in East Anglia to the cloth industry uh, instead for employment. And um, this is paralleled by the decline of the salt industry on the North Marshes. So so there we have it. Um, so fr frustrating in some respects, not firm in others, but there, there's enough to go on to um, to certainly bring in these more marginal environments into the fold of discussions along with the, you know, algal fields, along with fisheries, along with meadows, um, that we can, we can talk about, uh, provisioning, um, of medieval towns from, from salt marsh, woodlands, for example. Okay. Thank you. Pottery supply in medieval Colchester and Norwich, woodland and heathland industries. I agreed to contribute to this seminar because I have been talking with colleagues about new evidence for rural industries that appear to thrive on more marginal land close to or with ready access to major towns, but that the evidence for the products of these industries is not generally archaeologically recoverable in the urban places themselves. Having a specialism in medieval ceramics, a material type that was regularly manufactured on the same categories of poorer land, but which is very visible in urban deposits, I felt that I might be able to contribute an additional dimension to our growing view of these rural-urban relationships. In writing this paper, I have not utilised new ceramic data 
but I have drawn on the largest published assemblages for both Colchester and Norwich, as published by John Cotter in 2000 and Elizabeth Popescu, Arena Lentovich and Rishenda Goffin in 2009, revising and recalculating numbers appropriately for my purpose. My first slide presents a summary of Cotter's pottery fabric type and period data for urban Colchester from the 11th century. Unfortunately, I was not able to get clear numerical data for the late Saxon types, so it will suffice to note that Thetford type ware, primarily supplied from kilns at Ipswich and thus of urban origin, was dominant pre 11th century, but that this was substantially replaced in the 11th century by early medieval sandy wares of mixed urban rural origin. The handmade often clamp-fired and regularly rurally manufactured 11th to 12th century early medieval ware industries of Eastern England are a well-known phenomenon, particularly as they follow regionally significant and often urban-based late Saxon industries and involve the use of the potter's wheel and kilns. This type is replaced in the town's assemblage by firstly medieval sandy grey wares and subsequently Colchester type wares, which are mainly oxidised with regionally significant glazed ware industries also figuring from the mid 12th century. Slide 2 from John Cotter's 2000 volume on the post Roman pottery from Colchester shows a central defended area of medieval Colchester and identifies the position of 12th to 13th century kilns at Middleborough just outside the North Gate. These kilns produced a late version of the early medieval sandy ware that was so dominant in the town's assemblage, but as Cotter clearly identifies, other fabric types and other production centres did exist for this ware, but we believe that these were located elsewhere in the rural landscape and not on the periphery of the urban place. Whilst this slide is visible, we should also note the location of three 15th century kilns that produced Colchester type ware a short distance south of the South Gate. No other evidence for medieval pottery manufacture is known for the town, and in fact both of the pottery industries represented by these kiln sites more usually had rurally based production. For early medieval sandy ware, these other rural production centres included the heading and ware industry located around 15 miles to the northwest of Colchester, which is in the parishes more immediately to the north of the town in the former forest area of Sesterwald, where we suspect much of the town's pottery supply derives. But not only was some of the early medieval sandy ware production located in Sesterwald, here also lay much of the production of both of the other two wares that, that dominate the town's medieval assemblage. The other two principal types of utilitarian pottery being medieval sandy grey wares that were in addition also made in the heading and ware industry and Colchester type ware. Go to Sesterwald in slide 3 and as already described by my colleague Graham Clark this area of woodland and heathland lay just north of medieval Colchester. Here in the parishes of Mile End and subsequently Great Hawksley, pottery manufacture took place over several centuries. There is plenty of archaeological and historical evidence for this medieval pottery industry, but with this slide I want to simply show the spatial and temporal development. As already described, we have an excavated late 12th century production site on the edge of the town. Also, excavations in both the early 1970s by Drury and Petchy, and more recently by the Colchester Archaeological Trust, have provided much data on pottery production at Mile End that took place alongside the main road northwards from Colchester. Here all three of the major ceramic types known from the urban assemblage in Colchester were produced spanning the 12th to 15th centuries, with the early stages of early medieval sandy ware production possibly predating those at Colchester, Middleborough in the 12th century. The industry developed into one of some substance, with several kiln sites known for excavations and documentary records of the activities of named potters from the late 14th century onwards. This industry was clearly cited as close to the town of Colchester as was viable, once access to the necessary resources of available land, clay, fuel and water were taken into consideration. Alongside the pottery industry, we have plenty of documentation of tile manufacture here from the late medieval period later on a brick slide 3 also identifies further medieval pottery manufacture centered on the same north south routeway through Sesterwald but 2 kilometers further north in the parish of Great Hawksley as noted by Cotter records exist for potters working here in the late 13th century there being as many as 12 newly arrived in 1293 to 4 and Cotter suggested that these might have transferred up the road from Mile End 
This is an interesting suggestion. With an expanding market at Colchester, but limited access to resources along the roadside at Mile End, and perhaps with former woodland further north becoming available, such a dynamic seems plausible. If one adds to such a suggestion the fact that, so far, the earliest evidence that has been found for the production of pottery at Great Hawksley is of sandy greywares dating to the 14th century, then a model of expansion northwards over time in Sesterwold is reinforced. Norwich and Norfolk Slide 4 presents all current evidence for medieval pottery production sites in Norfolk. All that needs to be said with regard to the pre-Norman conquest phases is that late Saxon pottery manufacture was almost exclusively of Thetford-type wares. The majority of these were made in large urban fringe industries at Norwich and Thetford, but in addition, some Thetford-type ware production took place in rural locations. One of these was Grimston, northeast of Kings Lynn, and the site of much more famous glazed pottery manufacture. Others were mostly small-scale rural concerns in both the south and north of the county. As was the case in Colchester, Thetford type ware was superseded by early medieval wares. It is believed that these were entirely rurally manufactured, but evidence for this is mostly sparse, with only some wasted groups at Francham in mid-Norfolk and an excavated clamp production site and wasters at Blackburn End in the west of the county currently known. It is clear that currently the main sources of early medieval wares as used in Norwich or across Norfolk generally have not been identified. From the 13th century onwards, reduced grey wares again became the dominant utilitarian pottery type and at Norwich these are known as local medieval unglazed ware or LMU. Slide 4 shows from the same documentary suggestions only possibly possible hot pottery manufacture in central Norwich or close by the in the 13th and 14th centuries, but this is by no means a confirmed production centre. Of more interest are the red circles located at Wood Baswick and Potter Higham, to the east northeast of Norwich and some miles from the city. We will return to these shortly. Located in West Norfolk, the very well known Grimston industry was the most important supplier of glazed pottery of the period, its glazed products being found in small quantities at sites in all locations as well as being very prominent in urban assemblages at Kings Lynn and Norwich. Interestingly, although both Grimston and Blackborough End produced unglazed greyware pottery, it seems utilitarian wares at Kings Lynn were often supplied from adjacent counties via the Fenland waterways. The final point in relation to slide 4 is the supply of locally made pottery in the late medieval period. At Norwich, the dominant ware is known as late medieval and transitional ware or LMT, Aside from a waste of scatter from Sackling and Nethergate, until recently most of the evidence of production of this important type was from kilns identified and or investigated along the Waveney Valley, mostly as published by Sue Anderson. Her observations have always been that there must have been production centres closer to Norwich, and a recent waster group identified in excavations at Great Plumstead does demonstrate exactly that. To present some clear information in relation to the relative importance of various production centres in supplying medieval Norwich, I have taken the pottery data generated by Rena Lentovich and colleagues at, at the Castle Mal excavations, and I have summarised these initially as slide 5. Much of that which I have just described is borne out here. Firstly, unlike at Colchester, there are good data for the late Saxon period, and here the preeminence of Thetford type ware made in the urban centre itself could not be more impressive. Secondly, in a manner that is very comparable to the histogram shown for Colchester, one can then see a replacement with early medieval wares, and these are then replaced by LMU, the local coarse grey ware product. A period of supply of both St Neert's type ware and Yarmouth type ware complicate the picture in the middle of this progression, whilst from the late 12th century, the appearance of glazed vessels is this time represented by pottery manufactured at Grimston. As a coda to this study of the urban assemblage, it is perhaps interesting to quickly review slide 6 that presents all the pottery from these producers that can generally be defined as mainly urban or mainly a rural product. The change from one to the other over the late 11th to mid 12th century is really quite stark. It seems that everything about how pottery production in East English society was enabled, allowed or discouraged changed over this period. I mentioned a few minutes ago that I wanted to consider evidence for the production of the local greyware known as LMU and producers at Wood Baswick and Potter Hyam. Slide 7 
is a copy of part of Farden's map of Norfolk from 1797, and I have marked up these locations, as well as the recently identified LMT Waste Group in Great Plumstead. The natural landscape, landscape of this area of land northeast of Norwich in the medieval period was dominated by the massive area of land known as Mousehold Heath, as shown here, and which was quite possibly even larger in the earlier centuries. The heath certainly seems to have incorporated the medieval and late medieval pottery production sites at Wood Baswick and Great Plumstead. In the 21st century, Mouse Old Heath is, is restricted to a few hectares on the fringes of central Norwich, but previously this extended for 10 kilometres or more north, north, north eastwards. As with Sesterwald outside of Colchester, there was much later brick making on parts of this land and archaeological evidence shows it was also extensively used for charcoal making and iron smelting in Roman times as well as later. Dense utilisation of what might otherwise be defined as waste for a range of rural industries was perhaps facilitated by the large urban market of Norwich a few kilometres away. Beyond Mouse Old Heath, and particularly to the north and east, one immediately encounters the Norfolk Broads, another area of low value land of mixed usage in the medieval period. The broads themselves are known to be medieval peat diggings on a massive scale. Bearing in mind that pottery production can utilise peat as fuel as well as brushwood, it is no surprise that perhaps the largest group of medieval kilns where LMU is known to have been manufactured appear to be on the edge of Hickling Broad in Potter Hyam Parish. Another large area of heath, known as Catfield Heath and or Hickling Common, lies adjacent to the existing broad with the evidence for medieval pottery production lying between those features and the village of Potter Hyam with its former waterways and hives that formerly led into the broad. Clearly, with suitable potting clay available, all of the commodities and necessary for pottery production were available here. And in addition, there was easy waterborne access into the river system to take material to Norwich or Yarmouth or further afield. Conclusions this review has barely scratched the surface of the subject matter I have attempted to present two significant urban places in the medieval period. The main point I would like to emphasise is that poorer quality land that was easily accessible to major urban places would always be found to have a valid purpose in supply to those centres. Towns, their needs and the economic opportunities they presented would, if and once access was permissible, greatly influence the activities that could be carried out in these rural places some of which would otherwise offer only extremely limited opportunities for the creation of livelihoods. Many thanks to all our speakers for such a, an interesting and stimulating set of uh, presentations. I'd now like to welcome Dr Ben Jervis of Cardiff University to lead the discussion section of this seminar. Hey, okay, well, thank you very much um, for three uh, really interesting contributions and also uh, a bit of relief from the really rubbish urban sites that I've been reading about over the last week or so, uh, where you're lucky to have a ditch. Um, so members of the audience are welcome, I think, to sit through the chat function um, if they have any questions either for the speakers or for the panellists. Uh, I don't think we have any at the moment. Yeah. Um, so just kind of to reflect really on sort of some common themes maybe that jump out of the three um, contributions that we've had. Um, try and veer away from the obvious topic of food. Um, I think an interesting and often overlooked um, element of all three contributions was um, the discussion of fuel. Um, we saw that most explicitly through the charcoal, but also um, in discussions of, uh, of Oxford and Carlisle as well. Um, the second, um, I think, was the impact of, of towns on their wider landscapes. Um, so particularly the way that the salt marsh and the forests were exploited and shaped by the um, demands of, of urban communities. And also um, we heard particularly in Carlisle um, and also a little bit in Oxford um, about evidence for kind of cultivation and, and pasture within or immediately adjacent to um, the urban limits and kind of drawing into question the, the extent to which um, 
towns were were wholly reliant on a rural hinterland for their for their food and um, particularly for their um, their animals. Um, so I don't know if any of the panelists want to, to jump in and speak to either any of those um, themes or uh, something entirely different. I've got a quick question uh, about the um, Colchester site. I was just wondering if any um, pollen had been done locally that you've actually managed to get hold of to see what, what effects these industries might have had on the local woodland. Uh, no, we, we have I've not seen any pollen. No, no pollen. Even you've got. I mean, are there not deep deposits of uh, heathland or or peatland? Uh, we did um, have um, the charcoal looked at um, and speciated, and it turned out to mostly be, be oak, as you'd expect, probably coppiced. But we didn't actually have any material. It was very dry, sandy material. Right. Which wasn't suitable. It's a, shame. it's a shame, yes, but there wasn't any actual pollen that we could send off. No, uh, any samples for pollen that we could send off. No. Yes, uh, I was just just to, as on the other half of that paper, I suppose I'll just say. I mean, uh, Graham is right, and it, it hadn't crossed my mind before. But one of the negative aspects of these these uh, sort of these heathland landscapes is is they're not going to offer you much opportunity for waterlogged material and thereby get you'll have to make an explicit effort to go to the mirrors and things which we have in some of these some of these landscapes other parts of East Anglia and and, and look at uh, pollen sequences from there and that's a bigger wider research question but that th that would be the opportunity yes if you, if you get any of these um charcoal making pits next to a stream or anything like that yeah we must take the opportunity certainly but uh, we're just getting the the dry deposits within the pits themselves which um, are incinerated and backfilled um, th there's not a lot of opportunity there no. I think Chris has got something yeah there's a there's a theme that's worth uh, emphasizing which is hanging in the air around particularly the last contribution but it applies to the Oxford one as well, and that is the position of towns very often on frontiers between uh, different landscapes and different mm -hmm. uh, different types of uh, countryside. And uh, I mean, it's very striking. The uh, I had never really thought of Mousehold Heath as being as big as as we had told, but obviously there is you know a, a significant uh, area of. Of, of wasteland, you know, of, of, uh, as, as people in the Middle Ages would call it, in in uh, near Norwich. And of course, there's a lot of large areas of um, fertile arable land as well, and it is often the the, the town often lies on on the sort of um, point where these different land types are, are found. I mean, Oxford is an excellent example. And indeed, the speaker about Oxford was talking about the Cotswolds to the to the west and the uh, um, and the Thames Valley the the arable area to the to the east and and uh, and, and uh, Chilterns a bit further away so you know, i think it's very important to see towns developing in these niche positions between landscapes of different types I was just going to add it's exactly the same for Carlisle indeed Kingmore that Denise mentioned is known as waste and there is a larger expanse of blanket bogs and so on around the town. Um, so it is on the last bit of dry land before you hit Scotland. Hmm. I, in Oxford, um, where we think of it as being very agricultural, we do have from other sites evidence of gorse and heathland being used as tinder for the ovens. So, hmm. yeah, again, you know, the, there are wild spaces um, around, um, even in the Thames Valley. Uh, Brian? I, I, th I think it's quite interesting this relationship of, of towns with their local environments because of the impact upon the economy of the town itself. So this idea of provisioning the town, it's not just to provision frequently, not just the, to provision the town itself, but to enable the town then to use those provisions for, for other reasons. So the salt, for instance, that's going into Kings Lynn, I, I, I'm sure that uh, uh, there is far more salt going into Kings Lynn than Kings Lynn needs to use. <laughs> <laughs> but Kings Lynn is, is, is a nodal point for about 40 towns in, in eastern and central England because of the river system. Um, it's also um, uh, next to a very large agricultural area, so it may well be distributing an awful lot of foodstuffs 
and marine resources which need to be salted in order to get out to those to those various towns. So, so I think when we're looking at provisioning, we need to be thinking about um, how much the town is using and how much it's, as it were, redistributing. And also within the towns themselves and their immediate hinterland, how much of the provisioning they themselves are providing. So within central Norwich, you've got a massive quarrying and mining industry, um, which is producing huge amounts of, of um, chalk and lime, as well as flint to build with. Um, so it's this whole idea of, of provisioning, I, th I think can get very, very complex. And we, we need to try and think of it in the round, which is why looking at the landscape as well is so helpful. Uh, Paul. Uh, it was the point about salt and, the, uh, and salt for salting uh, brings me to uh, the, um, uh, the, the paper by Rebecca uh, and the vast evidence for huge varieties of fish in Oxford, as far from the sea as you can be, as, as Rebecca noted. Uh, and um, I, I'm amazed to hear that, that, as well as the stockfish later on and also the herring, uh, that there's that there's a whole range of other marine fish types from all over the place, uh, and some of that particularly uh, we're, we're perhaps from the southwest as well as the sort of stuff documented from Whitstable. And and um, uh, that, I thought that was really fascinating and interesting. And and I, I was wondering about how how comparable at different times that that the consumption of marine fish might have been in uh, might be compared. To, to the consumption of the of the freshwater river fish that's easily available you know, from the Thames, etc. Uh, all very interesting, but but uh, the, the the point really is just to reinforce Brian's point about the the, the, the vast um, importance, significance, and uh, and and need to distribute salt uh, to, to, uh, to sorry to bring salt in to distribute other materials as well as, well as frankly distributing salt as well. It's what salters did in the West Midlands was to take trains of uh, horses with packs of salt, sacks of salt on, uh, on their backs into the, into the countryside, you know, that they were, they were sometimes traveling 50 miles and more um, to, sell, to sell their salt. This is from the salt making town of Droitwich. Um, the, so there is a, you know, there is a flow of goods into the town, as, as Brian was saying, and then there's a, you know, it's hoarded there and then sent out uh, to, the, to the countryside. What interested me about the fish in Oxford was, yes, that extraordinary richness and complexity, um, the sturgeon and, and, and various other things that, 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 uh, that are coming out from, from Oxford. Um, but the two questions, really, the sites that you were describing were relatively high status, I would argue. Um, and, I, and it would be interesting to know what a, a more general site in Oxford would, com would compare with those. Um, and secondly, some of, the, some of the finds seem to be extraordinarily exotic. So not just the fish, but ptarmigan, it was suggested. <laughs> now, now that implies that you've gone to the top of the Cairngorms. Um, and uh, if, if, if that is the case, Marvellous, but um, that's, a, that's a very specialist find if, if it really was a ptarmigan com com coming up in Oxford. But it might tell you something about the types of scholars that you're getting there. Uh, yes, I think uh, if I can comment on that, that last one, actually I had changed that slide in the later version of the um, PowerPoint that I uploaded. Um, it, it, it was um, ptarmigan sized bird. So there's grouse and other similar um, yeah, similar birds that that could have been. It's why I had a question mark at the end. So not necessarily from the Cairngorms. Um, yeah. And yes, the range of fish. Um, I have found it fascinating um, to discover that when I consider the fish that we had in medieval Oxford, you could look at the fish market that you see today and it wouldn't be so different, to be honest. And I think it's a testament to how, how effective the transport links were both perhaps up the Thames, um, how navigable it was from the 14th century is a whole discussion in itself. Also, you know, up, once the roads had improved um, up from Southampton, I think that we underestimate how fast these, how efficient the transport links were. And, you know, fish was, yeah, the markets, I think, were 
much more varied. And you ask about the, yeah, what's a, a poor site? And I struggle actually to think of one necessarily in, in, in Oxford in terms of the, um, the well, the Fisher Sound, which is my specialism in particular, um, dominated by herring and eel, that's an obvious, um, perhaps a little bit less diverse some of the things like sea breams less common but you all you even but even on the poorer sites you get gurnards and you know uh you know a reasonable range of of fish as well as the the dried fish so i think this you know as i think i tried to point out also it's difficult it's much more difficult to identify a poor diet to a rich one um because the poor diet is vegetable based and you just don't find that evidence so where you're finding bones you know of, of um fish there's a certain amount of um of money involved obviously in the purchase of that but it but when i was looking across the sites um it's much more difficult from a food point of view i think to identify poor from from affluent although you can clearly see very affluent um you can see very affluent at the colleges and very affluent in the latter days of the friary but many of the other sites i would so say were sort of middling rather than poor if that makes sense have you got any sense of how the range of fish in oxford compares to kind of other maybe inland towns which aren't as well connected um I can't, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but some, somewhere else within the in the Midlands, which is kind of landlocked and doesn't have the nice river. Um, if I'm being brutally honest, I think we are very much affected by, first of all, the number of good urban excavations in a lot of Midlands towns, and also by how many samples were sieved. Um, so actually, no, there aren't, I, I, there are very few sites um, that are, you know sort of around Birmingham say Coventry area that have been excavated those that I I've seen um where they've done sieving um certainly the, the freshwater fish are of a similar a, a similar sort the herrings and uh, you know uh, are also there and, and the stockfish perhaps not the same great diversity of fish would be fair to say um but I think we need more um urban excavations from other towns to be fair Rebecca, I was very taken. Great, I yeah. Rebecca, I was very taken by how small the fish uh, that you looked at from Derby were. Yes, if, if you, you remember from Sadler Bridge. Yeah, I do, I do, um, and I'm trying not to be biased by assemblages <laughs> that I've looked at. But yeah, the more that I look at well sieved assemblages um, from across the country, the more evident it is that small fish that we normally wouldn't consider to be particularly edible were actually eaten um, and I think the more sample processing that's done the more we're going to find that's that's the case. Um, in medieval documents actually they're referred to as minnows and I think personally the term minnow means a small freshwater fish particularly saprinids um, and I think they were cooked in a whole variety of, of ways that made them you know reasonably palatable. It's, it's like it's like white white bait you know you, you can crunch your way through these small fish uh, today, but uh, as you say, minnows. Uh, the Bishop of Salisbury, for example, was very fond of minnows, according to his accounts. But could I just say, although you don't have uh, big urban excavations in, say, Litchfield or Coventry, uh, to take an example of Midland towns, we do know quite a lot about the sorts of fish that were available in the fish markets there. And you should never underestimate the capacity and the skill and the ingenuity with which fresh fish was put onto baskets on the backs of horses and taken in relays by road. I mean, you can't go yeah. by river because the river's flowing the wrong way. Uh, you, you, you have to go by road and it was organised and you did get baskets of fresh, unsalted, undried fish on sale in Litchfield and Coventry, for example. Yes, I, th I think you're right. I think the, that we, uh, we do underestimate the speed and the efficiency of these um, these um, ripier systems. Ripiers, that's right, that's the word. Yes, I know they came up from Southampton to Oxford, certainly mm. by the 16th mm. century. Yeah, um, you know, and with a fresh um, pair of horses, you know, swapped en route, I think they, they were very efficient. Mm. But, but I would guess, uh, very interesting, but I would guess that uh, access to, to that kind of product was not something that, that everybody was, was able to, to afford. Mm. Uh, mm. 
Uh, yeah, well, uh, unless uh, unless anyone can tell uh, tell me I'm wrong, it would, it would strike me as that is rather more of a of a rare and elite oh, uh, yes. the, opportunity. The, the poor eat salt herring, red herrings. That's the that's red the cheap Sorry, that red herring is is smoked fish. Comes in from the 14th century. Mm. Yes, yes. Well, it's cheap. Mm. Uh, you know, it's preserved and uh, it, it lasts a long time, and you can you can buy it cheaply. Um, just to break up, got a very quick question, I think, to answer on the on the chat. Um, yes. From the Carlisle talks, this is a question for Ian, I think. Uh, there was a photograph of the pig metapodial, one from a wild boar. Yeah. Uh, what's the approximate date of that example? I think you gave a phase, but not a date. Um, that one is uh, around about 13th century. Um, yeah, it's from the it's from phase thirteen, um, and then so, uh, the, the the much smaller one that was um, um, sitting right next to it is from phase seventeen, so late medieval. Um, <clears throat> but there, there are I, I think that pigs were probably raised on these plots throughout that entire time. the The evidence is not great because of some of the taphonomic problems. Um, but we may also be having per, per pigs brought in from, you know, hunted pigs. And it, it's plausible that that very large pig, I mean, there are various options for a very large pig like that. Number one, it might be wild boar. Number two, it could be a hybrid because you undoubtedly had escaping pigs, you know, uh, escaping domestic pigs, which could very well have hybridized with wild boar. You could have pigs that went feral. Um, and and you could have some very large dom yeah, domesticated um, sows and boars. So it, it isn't simple. And usually you might look at a, a third mandibular molar and measure that and compare that to a whole range of elements. But that is a particularly large um, metacarpal. And compared, for instance, to all the Durrington Walls data, Neolithic Durrington Walls data, that is larger than any, um, met, uh, the same metacarpal, any of them from Durrington Walls. So, you know, it's exceptionally big. It, it really is a huge animal. Um, so, yeah, I don't know whether that answers the question. More than answers question. Um, <laughs> can I make? Could I make another observation about yeah. animal bone, um, and, and indeed the, the importation of animals in, in into towns? I think we need to ask the question: Why are they doing that? As well as exactly what animals are they bringing in? Because they're not necessarily bringing the animals in always for food. Um, I can recall a, a, an excavation in Norwich where there was a very large quantity of, um, uh, of caprovine um, bone, probably goat rather than sheep, which was almost certainly associated with a vellum manufacturing site um, down by the river and, and adjacent to two large friaries and indeed the cathedral priory, all of which would, would require vellum. Um, so. Uh, it, it, uh, it's quite possible that some of these manufacturing towns are being provisioned um, not just to eat, uh, not just for eating, but, all, but also to, to enable other activities to take place. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Um, I mean, we have evidence, for instance, of Toyers, similarly, Toyers working um, in Chester, for instance, where there's huge numbers of um, sheep, uh, lamb sized metapodia, unfused ones. And they're all, you, you get large deposits of them, or at least we have, the, we have one particularly notable large deposit of them. Um, and they, they almost certainly do relate to the work of a fine light skinner. So whereas your heavy tanning industries tend to be moved out of the city centers, from say 1450 or, or slightly later. Um, they tend to be banned. T t tan tanning involves many noxious substances as people tend to know, um, creates a huge stink and tanners tend to get 
moved out of the city centres. But toyers or people working on fine light skins can work within the city centre. So in, in the case of Carlisle, there are numbers of goat bones and goats, are certain, there's an international trade in goat skins probably. So similar to the type of thing that you're speaking about, it's, you know, it is possible that these that goat skins are arriving various ways. Number one, they might be arriving from the Highlands of Scotland. Number two, there's an international trade, which has been documented more widely on the East Coast. But there are some indications, I mean, and, and then you've got during the Tudor uh, and the Stuart periods, you've got uh, huge amounts of trade between Ireland and the West Coast, Chester and Carlisle and so forth. So you have, yeah, and, and, uh, and this is uh, huge numbers of skins and the metapodials and, and the horn cores tend to be left attached to all of these skins. And so, yes, they arrive in the city centers and, and don't necessarily relate to um, meat consumption. But this, uh, I mean, there isn't time to go through it all the detail, but that is the, that, that's the reason for looking at your element representation. You know, are, are, are the metapodia hugely overrepresented as compared to the main meat bearing parts? Um, uh, in, in this case, they're not. In, in the case of these plots in Carlisle, they're not generally, although cattle horn cores are, are overrepresented. Um, cattle mandibles and uh, cattle head parts tend to be actually underrepresented as compared to those from the pigs and the sheep, for instance. Um, I don't know. Is that... that was really helpful. Thank you. OK, I remember one of my very early excavations in the 1970s. I was digging next to the hull hide skin and fat works. Oh. And uh, you're quite right about the smell. <laughs> it's, not, it's long gone. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just trying to think. Um, you talk about touring, like the light tanning, um, mm. and and I think it's in the Elizabethan period. There's some legislation that you're not supposed to do heavy and light leather, uh, light tanning together. Um, and archaeological yeah. is the the big site in Northampton is showing that this was happening fairly frequently that um yeah in other words people school. break the rules yeah okay. um right I'm, I'm conscious that abby you have not had a chance to say anything yet Do you have any, just if i could just response? butt in before before <laughs> abby speaks just to say that um, john schofield's had problems joining the panel but hopefully he'll join in a minute and i think he's got something to say when he does join but in the meantime sorry abby no no that's fine um i Oh, sorry. Hang on. Is that a bit better? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, I just thought um, I've got one particular question, which is, is possibly a, a small detailed one, but then, um, well, uh, so just for Ian, really, whether there's any documentary evidence for the Carlisle Lane site. And I think it's um, it's, it's great, really, that that, you're being, that there's work going on on the, one of those older assemblages, so sort of bringing older archive sites back. Um, yeah, so just whether there's any documentary evidence and possibly a slightly flippant question, but um, sort of picking up on what uh, Chris was saying about different towns, different landscapes and um, something that came up about the types of scholars in Oxford. I was wondering whether we're ever, well, we're going to be in a stage to where we could have a bit of a boat race compare Oxford <laughs> and Cambridge colleges. <laughs> are, there, you know, are there similarities, differences in their subsistence? I don't know. I think there's a lot of development work going on in the colleges in both towns. So. Possibly a slight curveball, but yeah. I, I don't know whether you want to have a go at answering that, Ian, or you want me to butt in a little bit. Yeah, you you can butt in. I mean, I don't know of I don't know of indictments, for instance, in the same way in in Carlisle. I, I, I know that there are some um, in Chester, for instance, for the pigs escaping and causing apparently havoc and so forth. But yeah, if you want to carry on. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to get in touch with John as well. Um, basically, uh, the late Bruce Jones, who was the county archivist, did some work uh, on the documentary evidence back in the 1970s on the site. 
uh, but nothing really has been done since. However, he did identify a suite of tenements in the records which he thought were the, the ones being excavated, um, which include, wonderfully, um, not as part of our talk, but I can't resist it, um, we got archaeological evidence of the first uh, primary lithage in England, at any rate, if not Britain, very rare in Europe, uh, in the medieval period for uh, silver processing. Uh, mm -hmm. On the same tenement, if Bruce Jones is right, uh, that uh, in the late 13th, early 14th century uh, was occupied by a John Ledbetter uh, in 1300 called John the Plumber. But uh, sadly, all the other um, occupiers of the tenements had names like the merchant or um, place name evidence rather than um, professional evidence, as it were, mm. which is a great shame. But it shows how tantalizing these things can be. Oh, thank you. So that that silver or that silver would be would not be would that be coming from a, a locals yes sort of very place? much so i mean one of the uh, claims of carlisle to rise to fame and fortune is uh, a, the finding of a, a very rich load of silver in the alston fells uh, which were still mined for lead right up into the 19th century um, and indeed were clearly mined in the the roman period and there's also silver known in the Coldbeck Fells, so both within 20 miles or so of Carlisle. And indeed, that probably explains why there was a mint there at the time of Henry I and indeed again later in the 13th century. Yeah. I, a, just coming back to that point that was made earlier about you know, the character of the town's kind of economy relating to the, the landscape around it. And uh, I, was, I was remembering another site in Carlisle, which is, I think it's in the it's sort of in the area that's associated with the goldsmiths as historical records, but um, it's a bronze foundry um, and presumably, yeah, it's, it's partly the fortuitous circumstances of archaeological excavation you stumble across these things, but also, you know, thinking about the, the sort of access to mineral resources and whether a place is able to kind of specialise in, in things like metal production as well, which we've not really talked about today, um, which is another, of uh, course, another what a uh, conflicting demand on, on that fuel as well. Um, Can I just pass in? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I'll just, uh, I'm, I'm actually presently um, doing uh, in the advanced stages of post excavation on the site just outside Eastgate in Oxford. Um, just at um, uh, one of three tenements, one of three medieval te tenements. And in one tenement, we've got one, we've got, we've got, uh, it's, substantial um, evidence for for Smithy and and we and we were able to um, uh, uh, even before we started the site uh, even before we before we started the site we were able to uh, 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 access the the, uh, the medieval deeds of, of these properties or, or these tenements and just happens that, that one of the tenements which we which we found the uh, the Smithy uh, during, the, during the early part, during the um, early part of the 14th, cent 14th century, it was occupied by Mr. Faber, and it's and actually refer, referred to as a forge. So, so just come, just just come that that is my, that's probably it's probably and it's and it's been identified as the um, the first smithy ever found in Oxford of of medieval date. So, um, so, so we, 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 I'm actually still uh, awaiting the, uh, the 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 better work and uh, or slag report. So, so hopefully um, uh, we should gain uh, a fair a fair amount of uh, 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 information on 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 the work and sort of smithy itself. Although unfortunately, we, we haven't actually found uh, uh, we found uh, very few tools, so I'm not quite sure what what the sniffy was doing. Presumably, repairing shoeing horses, whatever. <laughs>
but undoubtedly we literally got uh, almost poverty uh, about half a ton of slack across the side. Is it all is it all smithing slag? Yes, yeah, as far as, as far as we understand, yes. Yeah. Certainly from assessment, I'm, as I say, we're still waiting for the final final slag report. But uh, from the assessment, it's 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 smithing, yes. And and I'm I'm very pleased to see that John's been able to inv uh, to join us now, and I think yeah, he had yeah. a question as well. Yeah. Um, well. Firstly, I apologise for my incompetence in <laughs> uh, watching you for so long and not being able to um, turn up. But um, now I'm here, I'll just put in the penance for London, um, which is why I'm here, I suppose. Um, and I just want to say that um, I think you will find a range that uh, near the end of this somewhere, or uh, you'll get access to the title of a paper by Derek Keane in 2012, if somebody says, what about London? I will say, well, read this paper because it summarizes um, a whole host of London in its region uh, topics. It's in a rather obscure journal, but I'll leave you to, to see the reference and I can send it round if anybody wants. Um, he says, let me just read because it's on an adjacent screen here. Uh, two or three things he says. Um, he reviewed the extent of the territories for medieval London, the territories that supplied the everyday needs of the mass of its population for food, drink, and fuel. Don't know whether we've heard much about fuel. Um, and um, so he deals with the corn economy by far the largest sector, then gardening, uh, livestock, fish, horses, and transport, wastes, water supply, and fuel. Specialization in corn production around 1300 affected all 10 counties around London. And the regional contacts of London corn mongers went up to the Humber. When harvests were very poor in 1258, corn was sent on bulk from Germany. And at the same time, London could obtain supplies from anywhere in England if it wanted to. Livestock, sold in London came from up to 100 kilometers away and more. And by the 1420s, wealthy consumers could buy fresh fish brought overnight from Rye on the South Coast, rather like the later overnight trains from Scotland, which supplied Billingsgate. Um, so um, I, I like to think that any, any of your small towns is London on a smaller scale from the 10th century onwards. And uh, what this says is that this is how we attempt to study the region or the provisioning of London. It's so far solely by documentary historians like Derek Keane. The archeologists in London have hardly started. And this leads me to the suggestion that you're only going to get long-term, long-range contacts if you study the documents. So although we have had some um, allusion and use of documents in these presentations, it wasn't very much, was it? And so I would recommend that you see whether you can embellish your subject by looking rather more at the doc documentary sources. But please read this paper. Uh, the information will be given to you. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> I would endorse that. Um... Definitely. I mean, I was just going to say, you know, um... I mentioned the, um, the the piece on the peat cutting and the, and the charter, which I think was dated to the 1300s. I actually looked at the charcoal from um, Carlisle as well, and within the same document, I mean, this is down to Summerson, 1993, so quite a recent, relatively recent document, but it just shows how important these historic historians are for documenting all this information, and it's all there. But um, there's another record for um, which was dated to 1158, 58, this time by Henry II, which actually, which actually uh, granted residents of Carlisle access to um, a large area of woodland very nearby. And, and it was reflected in the charcoal, you know, there was a lot of mature oak wood throughout the, the, the period of occupation of the site. And, and I found that quite surprising that the you know, they obviously had access to mature woodland for over a long period. But then later on, obviously in the 1300s, the charter 
documents this shift in the use of peat, and that's slightly reflect, reflected in the environmental um, data as well. So all this stuff, when it comes together, you know, it's 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 fascinating, and I think that's what. If I had more time to do documentary research, I would. But you know, the what it can piece together is fantastic, really. Uh, uh, well, um, I, I'm I'm a historian, of course, but I'm going to give you some archaeological evidence. I mean. What strikes me about all of our presentations today is that everyone, quite understandably, is working on a town, Carlisle, Oxford, et cetera. Um, and uh, you know, there's a lot to be learned from the countryside because, I mean, we've heard about met just now about metal industries uh, it, uh, the, that uh, in Carlisle and in and in Oxford, and we um, and uh, jo jo John Schofield has talked to us about long distance connections and so on to London, but. Uh, I've been looking uh, just the last few days at the report on the, the now ancient report on the excavations at Seacourt, um, a village just outside Oxford. And what do you find? You find that the inhabitants of this village are uh, very well supplied with all sorts of metalwork, uh, buckles, belt fittings, um, you know, the usual, the usual uh, small metal objects. Uh, they've got lots of ironwork, um, horseshoes and so on and all that. Um, I mean, all of that's coming from Oxford, isn't it? I mean, that's that that's they're not making it themselves, and they're not making that sort of thing very much in the villages. Uh, it's 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 traded into to them into Oxford. They're travelling to Oxford Market, selling uh, corn and and wool and so on there, and using the money to buy the goods they need uh, from the Oxford traders. And and a lot of the Oxford activity that we've been talking about is geared to their to their needs. And of course, that village is very convenient for the park and ride. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, it was the, the park and ride, or rather the bypass, destroyed the village in the nineteen in the nineteen thirties, didn't it? But the, anyway, uh, the, 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 it's a wonderful site, uh, one of the richest sites, I think, in terms of small finds. I think somewhat atypical in terms of its small finds, in in my experience. Mm. Um, mm. Whether that's because of the size of the holes that were dug, or because of of where it's located, I don't know. Another um, thing about the small finds, I just made this point, which fits in with what John Schofield just said, is long distance things. I mean, part of uh, the finds at Sea Court include uh, German, um, uh, you know, the uh, lava uh, millstones, uh, uh, homes, uh, the whetstones from Norway, you know, long distance things coming in. And uh, where are they coming from? Oxford again. I mean, they're being traded internationally, of course, but they have to go to a town trader, a middleman in Oxford, and uh, and that's where the I'm sure the these goods were obtained. So it's it's a connection between you know the ordinary people of the countryside and the uh, and international trade. Uh, Rebecca, did you want to oh. jump in? I, I was just going to say that, yes, um, as far as fish goes, we know that, um, I think I said, in, in St. Aldate's, there were 18 <laughs> stalls that were called, uh, the, the documentation suggests were for Winchelsea fish, that's somewhere um, mm -hmm. in Sussex. So, you know, we, we do know that perhaps from, perhaps through London, but we know that, you know, fresh fish are coming from a long way away into mm -hmm. Oxford. Mm -hmm. um, and we also, you know, know that there was a big trade in salted eels um, from Flanders too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so the documentation does actually augment the archeological evidence quite considerably. And I think mm -hmm. looking at the two together is really very instructive. I think there's also considerable scope for expanding what arche what archaeology can do vis-a-vis -vis the documentary evidence as well. I was very struck reading reading a book on the provisioning of Norwich Cathedral Priory, which was looking at the priory accounts and their relationship to the rural estates. And not all the estates were paying rent. Some of the rents were being commuted into agricultural produce, which was then being brought into into the priory into the priory. Um, so that tells us something, obviously, about the way in which those various estates were organised. It would be quite interesting to occasionally get some spot excavation on some of those estates in order to see the types of goods which were being used there and which could presumably be related back to, to the city and, and, and the priory. The, the other aspect of um, the uh, relationship of archaeology to, to the documents um, people were talking about fish. I've been very impressed by 
the work that's been done on the isotopic signatures of fish, for instance, and the way in which that is now enabling archaeologists to answer questions which we could not even have posited without, without this information. So we're, we're now able to look at almost systemic changes in the um, provision of marine fish into some of the major centres um, over time, which is the sort of information you, you cannot retrieve from documents, but archaeology can now begin to find through this applied scientific analysis of, of fish bones. So yeah. utilising the two things together, as we've all been saying for decades, is yeah. obviously the way forward. I'm reminded, for, so, sorry, uh, Brian, I'm reminded you, you mentioned about uh, agricultural produce uh, uh, being supplied in, in, uh, as commuted rents. I'm reminded of the, the uh, Fenland monasteries and the sort of 60,000, 80,000 eel rents per year that uh, various estates were supplying to, to Fenland monasteries in, in the medieval period. Uh, and, the, uh, and we therefore shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be surprised if we are to find uh, lots of evidence for many, for, for many, many uh, eels on the basis of that kind of information. But in actual fact, archaeologically, we don't find a lot. I mean, uh, we, we do find we do we do find e uh, eel bone in 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 um, uh, archaeological deposits in, in and around the Fenland and its waterways, um, but we don't find uh, mounds of it. The, the, the clearly, as I've said earlier in in, in the presentations today I think from, from Ian that uh, you know we we see a very small number of individual uh, uh, organisms representing very large numbers out there in the natural and the farm <clears throat> landscape. The, um, the model of an urban monastery or a cathedral <clears throat> uh, being fed by its rural estates is very widespread it's the standard model so uh, why don't you uh, map the, uh, the rural manors of the house you're interested in, and that will be the zone which supplied most of its food. Right, we've got a couple of minutes left, if anyone has any final thoughts. I was quite struck by um, the, the nice plants, uh, Denise, that you had, um, that you had some very good pictures there. I was just wondering about, um, in a sense, like town salt provisioning, where it was uh, mentioned at the very beginning, actually, that you had 100 metre long plots, these tenements. So that's that's a big patch of ground. It was quite, mm. And that's a lot of boundaries between these patches of ground. I just wondered if there's any... Um, anything archaeological like hedgerows for instance or, or things like that that we can latch on to? No I mean that's something I, I, I asked um, John Sant who um, wrote the publication actually is what what the evidence was for the boundaries and there was very little there was no evidence for for wall structures or anything I don't think was there Rachel um, so yeah unfortunately very little. Well that, that can raise the potential can't it if there's no if it's not a big ditch or if it's not a big wall with the foundation then it could be an, an ephemeral hedge or just some rough boundary which gives you space for said plants. It was just, uh, just an observation yeah. that I had. Yeah I, was looking I mean at yeah I'm not, I'm, I, I probably went to town with a, a bit with the um, with the illustrations <laughs> and I think my, my talk probably came across quite synthetic but um yeah, there's there's a lot of detail there that I probably failed to pick up on that would have been of interest, but you know I only had a limited amount of time because um, there's things like you know I, I talk about whether or not plants were growing on the site or whether they were import, import, imported. Um, you know, there's a big study there for you know a lot of weed seeds can tell us um, what the ground conditions are like. So there's another study there where you could actually improve the data and actually you know understand which plants were likely to be coming from elsewhere rather than grown on the, on the plot itself you know so okay. yeah there's a there's a lot more to it I think I just sort of touched on the, on the surface really yeah because I was just wondering were you thinking more communal gardens or kitchen gardens or gardens I was thinking more food? allotments actually allotments. or a combination of two I mean it did it did shift in um their sizes did shift over time so I think you know originally it might have been one long plot but I think over time they started getting um, separated up into smaller plots and extra um, buildings were, were erected so it sort of 
it ended up being quite a sort of complex um, you know, system out the back, really. But in, initially, it could have, you know, I was envisaging allotment type plots, actually. So, okay. that um, plan that went up at the start, so I, think, I guess it was a 16th or 17th century plan of Carlisle. Uh, it was quite striking how much of the area was open ground or had trees or plants of some sort um, mm. depicted on it. Um, I didn't notice if about how, how the boundaries were depicted, but. Uh, and um, um, that's, yeah, I always find that quite striking looking at like, the speed maps. So I looked at the one from Ely a few weeks ago and it's, it's quite striking how, how little of the space in what was a fairly major regional cathedral city um, is, is open ground and, and, and not built on. Um, but, you know, it brings us back to that question of, of food production and, and, and those kind of things. Um, right, it's half past six now. That's when we're supposed to stop, isn't it, Rachel? So, uh, do I hand back to you to wrap up? Oh, um, yes, if, you, if you'd like. I'd just like to thank Ben as the chair and all the panellists, including John, who made it eventually, which is great, um, for mm -hmm. their interesting contributions. And um, just to say that this, uh, this presentation will be put on our YouTube channel in due course so if people want to listen to the presentations again and indeed the discussion uh, please feel free so thank you very much for joining us the next um, presentation will be in a few months time won't it Liz and it's likely to be on uh, something post-medieval so thank you all <laughs>